Maybe it was all that extra time that everyone had over the bye. Maybe all the players and all the coaches on the offensive side spent some of those two weeks looking at film and wondering why they never, ever, ever threw over the middle. Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Steelers. Comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also offer up Daily Shots of Penguins and Pirates where you found this. It might not have been the most significant component to the Steelers' 15-10 to victory over the Browns Sunday in Cleveland that they were able to, no, willing to throw the football over the middle. But, man, it was a welcome breakthrough. And you can't understand to this day why it took as long as it did what the reluctance was, what the fear was, how opponents placing a single high safety there was enough to spook the Steelers, not just this season, but halfway back into last season when John Harbaugh put in the scheme that completely undid the Steelers' 2020 season and, from an offensive standpoint, a chunk of the 2021 season. I feel like what happened Sunday in Cleveland was at least a first step toward getting over this this boogeyman element that's really held this whole football team down. Let me throw some numbers at you here, as thrown by Ben Roethlisberger in the game. Up the middle, from 0 to 10 yards, he was 4 of 5 for 87 yards. Five attempts, like five more than normal. Wait, it gets better. From 10 to 20 yards in that distance, also over the middle of the football field, he was 2 of 3 for 36 yards. That's a total of 6 of 8 throwing over the middle from 0 to 20 yards. There was one attempt that was longer than that down the middle. It was incomplete. So what you're left with over the middle of the football field was Ben going 8 of 11 for 131 yards. And yes, that obviously includes the Deontay Johnson slant there at the end that picked up 50 yards when they surprised the Browns who were sure that they were going to run. But hey, all of it counts. All of it counts. And being able to utilize that space on the field comes with two significant benefits. One of them, again, obviously, you're using some prime real estate. I asked Pat Fryermuth about this after the game in Cleveland. How important was it for you guys and yourself in particular to find the middle of the field the way you guys did regularly? Oh, it was huge. I mean, um, obviously I had a couple catches over the middle field, and, and Zach had a big third down conversion um, over the middle of the field. And, um, you know, when we find that middle of the field and, and utilize us, you know, our offense moves, and, you know, I'm really happy with how me and Zach played there. The other benefit to utilizing that space, I'll get to that in a second. First, this portion of Daily Shot of Steelers is brought to you by Point Park University. Choose from nearly 100 career-focused programs leading to bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Choose when and how you'd prefer to do that studying, whether it's at Point Park's gorgeous downtown Pittsburgh campus, whether it's online. Maybe a flexible hybrid format would work for you. Find out more about all of this at pointpark.edu. The second, and I think almost as important, facet of being able to utilize the middle of the field is that it'll make you want to use Fryermuth all the more. Listen, when the Steelers were announcing their injury reports leading up to the game against the Browns, and you saw that Eric Ebron was questionable with a hamstring, limited participant, then ruled out, And you realize they're about to take the field on Sunday with Fryermuth as tight end one and Zach Gentry as tight end two. 
it sure felt like they were finally putting their two best guys at that position onto the field. Mike Tomlin has a lot of strengths as a head coach. He also has some shortcomings, and I think that one of the latter is that he will lean toward that veteran. He will give that veteran the benefit of the doubt, often to a fault. What he sees in Ebron, what the Steelers in general ever saw in Ebron, I don't understand. I mean, I get he's efficient in the red zone. He can do some good things in terms of receiving, but he's not even a willing blocker, never mind an able blocker. He's operating within an offense that now demands that everyone takes on their blocking assignments with gusto. Najee Harris's touchdown run, the aerial one, Sunday, Najee himself credited Fryermuth with delivering the key block, which if you watch the video, you'll see that he does. He comes inside, takes a guy out. Najee has to go through a couple of – there were a bunch of good blocks on the play. Kendrick Green, Kevin Dotson came all the way across. Uh, Trey Turner sealed his guy. But Fryermuth was one of them. And the beautiful thing about having this player on the field – is that he's not some neon beacon advertising to the opponent what play is coming. Whereas if it's Ebron, you're thinking it's either going to be a pass or it's going to be a poorly blocked run. So why bother? Similarly, with Gentry getting involved, at least a little bit more offensively, you're seeing less predictability on that front. That's optimal for a tight end. You know, everybody's always bringing up Heath Miller anytime a tight end does well here. And, and, and that's kind of cool, okay? I'm not going to lie. It's also unfair. Heath was his own guy. Heath was special. But part of what made him special was that he never, ever looked at 83 on the field and saw it as a signal that any certain type of play was forthcoming. It was just Heath. You know, Heath could do anything. Heath could go 20 consecutive plays without a target, and it wouldn't raise an eyebrow because he's just Heath. He was going to handle his blocking assignment. He was going to make sure that he picked up a blitz. This is what you want out of your tight ends. And if the Steelers' coaching staff, beginning, obviously, with Tomlin, look at that game film from Cleveland and see how and why they threw effectively over the middle. And they see that it was largely because of their tight end play. And they also remember that they weren't doing anything of the kind with Ebron out there. You know, make the move. Make the move, whether he's hurt or not. Don't worry about stirring up any kind of fuss or whatever inside the locker room. Put your best players on the field. When we come back, just one question. Welcome back. It's time for Just One Question. That's brought to you always on this program by the personal injury law firm of Luxembourg, Garbett, Kelly, and George. LGKG. They represent people who are hurt in car accidents, who need help with workers' comp and medical malpractice claims. The attorneys at LGKG have been designated super lawyers for over 15 years. This is a real thing. It's reserved for the top 5% of all attorneys in Pennsylvania. Learn more about them at lgkg.com or by calling 888-842-5454. Our J1Q comes from Matt who asks, does the Steelers' winning streak and best performance of the year in Cleveland merit a trade before the Tuesday NFL deadline? Uh, You know, the first thing I thought of when I saw your question, Matt, was the best performance of the year in Cleveland. I don't know that it was. I mean, I guess I hadn't really thought about it. I know you threw that in kind of parenthetically, but there were some things 
about it that were the best performance, certain components. Uh, it certainly was the most important performance that they had given the juncture of the season and some of the stuff that I was talking about on the show last week and making references to, you know, do or die and things like that. But I think I've seen the Steelers at various points this year perform better in some areas. This just might have been the one where they put it all together. And again, this was the one that was going to be the biggest deal. To actually answer your question, or to try to, does what the Steelers have achieved here merit a trade? Yes. Yes, and I don't just mean moving a malcontent backup linebacker. I'm talking about a real trade that brings in real talent. You know, it used to be that the NFL trade deadline, which is at 5 p.m. today, by the way, was completely ignored. I mean, there were even jokes about it. Hey, did you know it was NFL trade deadline day? No, did you? And it would just go right by. That's starting to change a little bit. We saw Von Miller, future Hall of Famer, go from the Broncos to the Rams yesterday, and that starts getting people's attention toward the deadline. Wait a second. Why did the Rams do that? They already have Aaron Donald, and they're loading up. You saw the headlines for this. Loading up, cashing them all in, pushing in the chips, meaning the Rams. That's a lot of the stuff that you hear way more often when it comes to the NHL and Major League Baseball trading deadlines. Not with football. But when you're looking at the position that Von Miller plays, not that you don't have to know the playbook, but chances are really good that when he gets to L.A., the Rams are just going to say to him, you know, that thing that you've been doing your whole life, yeah, that, just do that. The Steelers have, I believe, every obligation to entertain an aggressive approach going into this trade deadline. And when I say entertain, you know, it takes two. It takes two. Somebody else has to be willing to do it. I would love to see, I would love to see Kevin Colbert land defensive line help. It's nice that Chris Wormley and Isaiah Bugs had a bit of a bounce back Sunday in Cleveland. But we don't know about Stefan Tuitt's status. We definitely don't know about Tyson Alualu. The idea that he's completely ruled out of the rest of the season uh, isn't accurate, but it's at least a reasonable bet. They could use help there. They could use help. I would be talking to the Eagles. I would be talking about Javon Hargrave. Bring him back. He's got one more year on that big deal at $13 million per, but it's affordable. It's affordable this year under all the cap room that the Steelers have, and it's affordable very much so next year. And if they say, well, listen, you know, we're not really out of it because we just beat the snot out of the Lions, which the Eagles just did. All right, well, we'll take Fletcher Cox then. Is that all right? And we'll send you a nice draft pick for it. You can do that. You can do that. The Eagles aren't going anywhere. That's the kind of move that I'd be looking at. Defensive line, offensive line. There's $11 million of cap room available to Colbert and Omar Khan heading into today. I'm trying to picture a scenario in which it's acceptable for these guys in what's likely Ben Roethlisberger's final season to say, yeah, we, we just left that on the table. You know, we didn't bother using it. You don't get cap space back when you don't use it, by the way. It's just gone. They don't say, well, you didn't use the space this year. You can have it next year. It's just a lost opportunity to make your football team better. I'm not going to advocate throwing around first-rounders and so forth, but I would really, really, really like to see 
a significant move made today. And again, not just the malcontent backup linebacker. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. Let's do it again tomorrow. Tomorrow.